everyone. <laughs> um, can we all uh, tighten in, you guys back here, if you can tighten in a little bit. I have a show that you're going to want to be up here to see. You'll be happy that you'll, you're there. Um, my name is Snugs, and one of the things that we do when we start off um, our meetups, have you all seen this whole you know, mannequin challenge and all that? Anyone where people are just like that? And so what we do uh, in New York is we have handstand challenges. So usually when I come in, the, there's a bunch of people in front of me, and they're kind of like, oh, I just got off of work. And I usually pep them up like this. So what we're going to do is you're going to count me down. You're going to say one, two, three. And on three, I'm going up. And you guys clap for me like somebody's doing a handstand in front of your face at RubyConf. I bet you it's the first one, right? <laughs> okay, so are you ready? You guys ready for this? Okay, so it's going to be on you all. We have to do a community, one, two, three, up, and then clap until I drop. How about that? Okay. All right. I'm waiting for you guys. One, two, three. <laughs> keep clapping, keep clapping. yoga teacher is going to be so happy on that one. Thank you so much. That's a nice icebreaker. I feel good. Uh, so great. We're all happy here and we're going to get to business. Now this is a talk that uh, it's, it touches me. Um, I know it's going to touch you. It's taken from the point of uh, some people in history and also some of the words of the people who are in NYCRB and the things that they say and we're going to get a little bit inside of their heads as well. Uh, I can promise you that it won't be offensive, because they kicked me out, but it is going to resonate with you. You're all interested? Uh, and it's mostly words. So <clears throat> here we go. Why is open source so closed? So semantics of words. When words pop up, they, they resonate with us and they trigger certain things, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And so this is right here. This is, uh, can anyone tell me who this is? Augustus Caesar. Uh, why is he so awesome? I guess so, right? Uh, so, you know, usually personalities pop up out of cults. Uh, can anyone tell me what this image is, though? Apple One, actually, this was a little culture, cult if you will, they call themselves hacker cults, um, the homebrew group. So this was uh, where a lot of interesting things came out of. Um, I consider it really the first open source group and before it got a little bit of, um, you know, wrong fingers in a bunch. But if you don't know anything about the homebrew group, um, it's a little bit of head nod to it when you ever brew install something. Uh, I won't go into it into detail, but it's definitely something that you should understand about your history. Because out of these cults oftentimes come personalities. So if we go back, this is the homebrew group and it's in its infancy. And this is the homebrew group around when you kind of knew everyone but didn't quite know everyone. Um, you know, you see some faces, they come and they go. But there's definitely movement within the organization. So personality, that reminds me of one of my favorite, I love 80s rock, metal, I'm a drummer, and there's this one band called In Living Color, and they had this song called Cult of Personality. And if you've ever heard it, it's, it's just such a song that resonates with me. Um, one of my favorite lines is neon lights, Nobel Prize, when the leader speaks, that leader dies. Um, I like it because it's dramatic, so you have the sadness in it. And you also have the happiness because how often can you rock a body glove like surfer outfit with a leather jacket on while you're rocking on stage? Like who does that now? <laughs> right? uh, so now once people have their personalities, then all of a sudden we feel, wait, whoa, yeah, okay, we can do that. That was a little bit of snafu. Um, but once we have our personalities and out of these groups, we have this notion of free. 
Like, oh my God, like I can write code and all I have to do is just blah, rainbows out of my mouth and then every, all my tests pass, right? <laughs> this is the feeling that oftentimes within an organization, with NYCRB, um, we have a churn of people who come out of boot camps and things like that, and that's exactly the feeling that they feel. Now, with the, with the problem with the word free, I won't say a problem, but it's used for very many things. Um, there was actually an issue with the word free from back with open source where uh, they stated, well, you know, free, I don't know if you kind of get the word. So the issue with the English language is we use one word for many, many things. Um, to whereas in other languages, you go, like your Latin languages and such, there is explicit words for certain things. So then the word gets out. Like everybody, we're going to go to these boot camps. There's going to be tons of work for us to do. And, you know, you don't have to even really do anything but just like raise your hands up and then like press this button and like code starts creating itself and stuff. You know, I got a cool scaffold. Um, so after they come out, then... There is a notion of demand. When you hear the word demand, how many people, pardon me, pardon me. There we go. Hello. Uh, so when you hear the word demand, can I see a raise of hands of how many people feel that to be a positive word? Okay, that's about half the room. How about, uh, I, like your, I like your answer. Um, how, how many people see it as a negative word? Can you raise your hand? Interesting, it's like almost half and half, fascinating. And you know, you're the wishy-washy one. You're just like, ah, you know, depends on the day, right? <laughs> or the pull request. <laughs> what about command? Uh, how many people see it as a positive word? How many people see it as a negative word? Mm, fascinating. Um, oftentimes, even with demand, um, how many of you saw demand as in the matter of economics? Okay, cool. In French, which I uh, study frequently, um, I'm actually teaching myself, um, the word command actually is more assertive. I don't want to really say negative or positive. Demand is to ask. So there's a lot of language differences, especially with Google Translate, where you can say, I want to uh, demand something, and you're really asking, but if you don't say things like bonjour, then all of a sudden you're a jerk, because now you're demanding. It's the context, even of the words around it. So we hear about, oh, there's so much demand in being a developer when you come out of these boot camps, right? There's demand. But what they wind up facing is uh, a word, oppress. So it happens in two ways. There's pressing horizontally and oppressing vertically. Uh, horizontally, or let's start with vertically. Vertically would be when the boot campers come out, they're fresh and new, but all they get doors slammed in front of their face. <sighs> We're looking at mid to senior level. Who's ever heard that? Who's ever been there where they weren't mid to senior level and they heard that? I, I mean, if all of you aren't raising your hands, then... <laughs> you probably need to be looking for more jobs, or maybe you're better off than I am. So that's horizontal or vertical. Horizontal is, you ever have that feeling sometimes where you're working with someone and they're like, well, why do you do it that way? You should kind of like do it my way. Why aren't you, you know, and this is why we have things like RuboCop and things like that to keep us from pulling our hairs out. But this is a real thing, and it's tiny. You don't ever really see it unless you squint. And we not only do it amongst ourselves, but we do it to ourselves. And then the supply drops. And what I mean by the supply dropping, it's twofold. The supply of jobs that boot campers thought that they were going to get is no longer there. Uh, if it was even real, but that's just the path that they took. Um, so they come out and they see no supply. There is still demand. Um, people still want time. But what's fascinating is, is that Demand doesn't shrink, supply actually shrinks. And the, person who, and the ones who control the supply are actually the ones that are in the more control. So what's interesting to me is it seems like developers actually should hold more control of the supply, but it seems like it's flipped because the supply of the jobs are no longer there. Or at least that's the impersonation that these people have. I have to deal with it every meetup. 
man, I've been looking for this job. Like I went to boot camp, like everyone said. It's two years now. What did I do? What did I do wrong? So then we find the understanding of the true word of free. Uh, free, there's two forms of it in Latin. There's libre and gratis. But we, in English, we utilize it, we say the same word, multiple, uh, we say the same word for both situations. Little did they know, they thought they were free, but their version of free was actually gratis. And, I mean, since it's zero, you might as well get rid of the, the money. <laughs> that, that's what you feel like sometimes, or at least I have. So then you're working, and you're working along, and you're working along, and you're like, well, I'm doing everything, like I'm doing all of this work, I'm not seeing any productivity from it. And what's fascinating about this word is I went back in time and did some history uh, about this word. There was a physical sense, which I'm sure we, we don't have to go there. We all know about that. But then there's this mental. I feel like in this day and age that the mentality of slave is just that in the head. Um, I was talking with my mentor the other day, and I said, you know, um, in 2016, it seems like slavery is more mental, um, and we, it's self-inflicted, you know, with fear. We say, oh, I can't, I don't think I'm good enough to do that, and you have to have someone kind of pick you up and such, and it's like you're beating yourself up for no reason. And then that whole idea replicates, because that's what we do when we have those. I mean, who's ever run a database cluster? <laughs> that's exactly what we do. We take the same mentality and we let it proliferate. Because remember, this talk is about the people who are behind the machines, not just the machines. How, do, how does our mental patterns translate over to the machines and vice versa? So then once we feel that sort of like, well, what's going on here? Like, I know, I know something's not right, but we're all saying the same. And, you know, you try to talk to your colleagues, but they're talking upside down, too. And it's, you're trying to have civil conversations, but you're doing it, but everything's flipped. And what I say by everything's flipped is because you, you know, you and I, we could turn our heads and see that that says civil, but everyone else is looking at us like, why are you turning upside down like that? But we don't know that. Then disorder comes. Like, you know, I heard there's something new out there. I know what I'm doing is great. I don't even want to look over there, but why do keep, so many people keep looking over in that direction? And then it really hits you because you're like, whoa, wait a minute. What's this close sign doing on our door? And we didn't put it there. Wait, why didn't anyone tell me that we were closed? We're out of business? You could have told me this before. You know, I had some things I had to set up. And you feel sort of abandoned. It's like you know this great skill, but you don't know how to push it out into the world, how to market it. You don't know how to, you know, who do I talk to? I put so much time into this. Sometimes you feel like a failure a little bit. So, you know, why? Why is this happening? Maybe there is a more radical approach we can take. I was doing some research with a lot of the things that are going on um, in the world today, and I actually wound up tripping over uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, who does not know who Dr. Martin Luther King is in here? Honestly, you never know, right? So everyone knows who Dr. Martin Luther King is in here. Have you ever heard his I Have a Dream speech? Okay. What if I were to tell you that with some colleagues of mine in Stanford and also with some information from MIT, I uncovered a document that not only could be beneficial for us all in how we're thinking, um, but we can use it in our day-to-day -day as well. And I'd be willing to say that the majority of people in here haven't even seen it, but it's just as valuable as I have a dream speech. Would you be interested in seeing it? In Bennett College, there was an interview with Dr. King. On 11 February, King delivered a realistic look at race relations to an overpacked audience in Bennett College's Ann Myrner Pfeiffer Chapel. In his address, King stressed the importance of a ballot. While, not, while noting the limitations of the two major political parties, quote, I am not here to tell you how to vote. That isn't my concern. I'm not a politician. I have no political ambitions. 
I don't think the Republican Party is a party full of the almighty, almighty God, nor is the Democratic Party. They both have weaknesses, and I'm inextricably nailed it, <laughs> bound to either party. I'm not inextricably bound to either party, and I'm not concerned about telling you what party to vote for. What I am saying is this. We must gain the ballot and use it wisely. So at first I thought, I mean, this really messed my head up because I was like, wait a minute, that's not what I was kind of told before. That's not what, I was, what was passed down to me. I, how am I being offered and saying that there, I have alternatives? It's not that something's better. That's better. Go over there. It's more have alternatives. And I tried to refute it, and he said that, you know, you can move mountains doing this. And this is actually in the Washington Memorial. They have it so it seems like he's pushed out of the mountain. I think it's one of the most, like it's a breathtaking structure, uh, and it definitely resonates for sure. It says, out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. So I still couldn't get it, though. I'm like, why? I'm like, why? I had to actually take a step back and reformat and reprocess my home brain because I'm like, wait a minute. I'm being told I can, it's okay to have options. It's okay to sort of dip your feet in both sides. And then I'm taken back to my good old Uncle Bob where uh, after a, about a handle of, about, I don't think it was 15 shots of bourbon, tasters, tasters. Uh, he had a talk where he was telling me, he said, look, Rashawn, you're, a lot of the ways you're thinking are very innovative, and when the tide changes, there will be people that say, don't do that, instead of saying, this is why you do this. You want to be wary of those people because those people don't realize that that tide is coming in. And he said, one thing that's very important to me, there's two types of people. There are people who swim against the waves, and he says there's people who know how to surf. And so he's like, you want to surf the waves. When a new technology comes, jump on it and surf it a little bit. Or swim against the waves. The choice is yours. But typically the people who have tenure in their career, that's what they do. Hashtag wavy. So that's what I did. I said, I'll take you literally. I'll take you up on that, Uncle Bob. And I, I went surfing. I tested it out. Um, every single place you see there is a check-in, actually. And I spent about, I'm still on this path. I actually just got off the airport since uh, right before here. I said I would go out and find myself. Um, other people have said you have to travel when, you, when your brain gets to that point where it's like, oh, my God, it's like every, there is no spoon. Everything I know is not real. You have to go out. You have to be mobile. You have to go search. You can't just be inside and sit. Um, you don't have to travel as far as I did, but you could go and say, hey, you know, I haven't talked to you in a while. Do you know of any stuff that I can work on or anything that I can drum up? You're taking it into your own hands, I'm not waiting for someone. That's that passion that Abdi was talking about on Ruby Rogues. So then the word doesn't quite seem so bad once you have like-minded people around you. You know, you put some ore on it. It's not, you know, it doesn't sting so much. Um, still the same root. And as I'm traveling around, and actually Dr. King did the same thing. Um, they said that they didn't really understand what this, how the world was until they were mobile. Um, they say that when you travel, you have an extra pair of lenses to see the world through. Um, some of the greatest problems I've ever solved have been me on an Amtrak train. Just like, oh, there it is right there. Actually, in the bathroom in an Amtrak train. Because they typically say you have your greatest ideas in the bathroom or in the shower or in the kitchen or something like that. Uh, Some place where you're at your, you know, your physiological response side of things. So when I was in France, actually, which I travel too often, they asked me a question. They said, why do you use this two-party system thing that's going on? Um, I didn't know anything about this word. And he says, uh, we have like 10 people. And when somebody wins, they go and they reach out to the other nine people and say, you know what? You had a great idea. I like what you did a la carte. Your idea was awesome. That one thing, I don't know, buddy, but however, you did show passion in his idea. So why don't you two work it out? And this is after the electoral process happens. And he said, you, you don't even have the ability to be set up within that whole two-party system. Um, when Martin Luther King actually went to Sweden after he kind of had that why over his head and trying to figure out what he was doing, uh, he went to Sweden and he met socialism. Uh, and you notice that there were no slums. 
Imagine being in a place where you say is the greatest place you've ever been, and then you go to the place that people have told you is not good, and there's no slums. There's no bad places. Maybe there were, but to you it was all new. It didn't look like it to you. It doesn't mean that you're going to stay over in that place. Um, you'll definitely come back, but you'll see the world through a different set of lenses. One of the areas that is often not touched on is uh, capitalism. The fact that we like to make money and feel good and earn things. Now, everything in moderation. I'm not sitting here telling you to be any one of these words, because if you ever notice, each one of them is still an ism. And, you know, isms are as isms are. Uh, however, they are real. Um, there are real people who come to me by the hundreds that say, I'm a junior developer trying to get a senior developer, and there's like this chasm right here that I just can't get over that's what I call like the middle class of developer, um, the mid, you know, they say mid to senior level. I still have yet to see a mid person yet. You know, I've seen senior, I've seen Greybeard, I've seen Ivory Tower once or twice. I think he was wearing Birkenstocks. Um, and I've seen Junior, and I've, well, I've seen, you know, New, and I've seen I'm Scared, and I've seen I've only been writing code for like a month, dude. Like, you know, I can hack up the heck of an of a HTML page where I know how to, I'm your Postgres guy. I don't know anything else. So how do they make money? Where do they go? Do you, one of the things that we don't learn as developers is how to market ourselves how to actually go out and say, this is what I have to offer you. You can be a great-minded person, but if you never open that mind and show other people and solve their problems, it's going to be very difficult for you to eat. Then you're, you know, working for, you're just working for beer scraps, for HTML, free beer, you know? Not the uh, gratis, well, definitely the gratis, but definitely not the libra. But what I did get and what others who have sort of gone out of their comfort zone is they get libre pour gratis. That means you get freedom for free. You might have to pay a little bit for it, but the amount that you will see from your eyes, now this could be in travel, this could be in front of your computer in that one little gym that you've been itching to taste, but just because it has semicolons in it and curly braces, every, you don't want anyone to let you see you over there, but, you know. That's the oppressed side. And there's free beer. But never forget home. Uh, as I was traveling and as I encourage other people to travel, even in their code, I encourage people to travel in their code just as much as I travel physically. Um, go out and explore other gems and other repositories. Um, heck, you know, try out JavaScript. It's okay. I said it. I said it. I said it. I said it. But don't forget where home is. Um, but then again, what's fascinating about Ruby is Ruby reminds me of America a little bit. Um, at the end of the day, we're, none of us are really from here for the most part, but that would be disrespectful to a certain few um, because there are some who are the first. We must pay homage to them, but we also have to realize sometimes what we call home, um, others might tell us, you might want to put air quotes around that, right? Because you got here from PHP, you got here from Java, you got here from the Middle East. So it, it's all relative, right? So when I got back, or when you do come back, you'll notice that your open source was slightly open because you've seen someone else's, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Like, they got this cool stuff over here. How come I'm not doing that? A perfect example is uh, in the conference room or in the speaker room before. Let me check my time here. Excellent. Okay, great. In the speaker room before, um, one of the gentlemen said, yeah, I, I went over to JavaScript, I tried some things out, and it was just, I was so happy to get back to Ruby. It was, what was that? Was that you? No, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. My eyes are bad, man. I'm a programmer. Um, <laughs> and I said, well, is it really that bad? Because my mentor, um, Tom Mornini, who uh, he is a founder of Engine Yard, and he put it in my head, and I know I'm saying this wrong, Tom, I know, but he says uh, it's, it's to the akin of any developer can write equally bad code in any great language. Um, say that with me, please. Let's do it. Any developer can write equally bad code in any great language. 
So when that happened, I mean, I, I saw kind of the click in his head, and I said, well, one of the things I got great from JavaScript, I just rolled over there, and I fall onto being a contributor to one of their projects. I find a project called Rollup, which I'm a contributor to right now, um, and then I look at the ecosystem. I'm like, well, wow, everyone's using Babel, but this thing, Rollup, is so cool. It's got, I just put my, li my JavaScript libraries into it, and my code was 20% slimmer immediately. And I can throw SAS into this and CSS and templates and all of this, and it just compiles, like squishes everything down and leaves a thumbprint smaller than Webpack and all. Why did no one tell me this? Because they still have me over here programming in CoffeeScript. Like, what's, well, how come I'm not experiencing all these cool new things? So it was slightly open. Then I start, then I feel that. And you often feel that sometimes, especially when you go away and you come back to something and you realize it wasn't just what you thought it was. Um, hate's a strong word. I often tell people that hate is a form of love. Um, hate is love that you don't understand. You know, hate is a word that developers often use when they're learning new technologies. One of my buddies is like, man, this, this JSON thing, I hate JSON, dude. And I'm like, you forgot, a, you forgot a quote. And he's like, oh, that's it? And then he went wild in the JSON, and he, two hours later, he calls me back. He's like, hey, man, after the meetup, I went home, and I programmed JSON for two hours, and I love it, dude. I love it. <laughs> and I'm like, see, well, you did have a hate for it before, but now you understand it, and now you have love. But we have to really be cautious that hate actually can draw more emotion out of us because we don't understand it. So we'll spend so much time in it. Who sat there so long like, I'll just be done in two hours. And seven hours later, one more hour, I promise, right? That's the hate turning into the love. Then once you understand sort of what's going on and can shed emotions and such, and whether you're traveling or in uh, we're, GitHub repositories, you see what I'm doing here? <laughs> when you're in the mind, um, the mind is an interesting thing. As we said before, my interpretation of um, what slavery is starts here in your head. Um, knows no boundaries, no colors, no financial sectors. Probably does more so there than color. What you, want, what you then do once you understand what's going on in your mind and what you want, uh, you then go find like-minded people. This is the critical part. Uh, one of my mentors stated that you find typically people who are same, similar minded look the same, but if you would like, or correction, let me rephrase this, typically people who are like minded, you'd expect them to look the same. However, there are many, many edge cases you'd be surprised. Just because someone looks like you, whether it be in code physically, you know, uh, RuboCop, whether you know, eat lenting. Just because someone looks like you doesn't mean they think like you. And just because someone thinks like you doesn't mean that they look like you as well. There's many, many edge cases. There's more than you'd actually think. So what I mean by edge cases are um, what I call the line of demarcation, where you have two ecosystems that are landing. And you know, they might call, that might be where the line of scrimmage is on a football game or in a battle. That's where that line is. And what winds up happening is that's where the most action and the most learning happens. Because he may be programming in React and, and, and learning APIs a little bit. I might be in, um, <laughs> not able to use this microphone, but I might be uh, programming in, say, Sinatra. Um, and I don't have anyone that can do front end work. So if I just bump into him, maybe just say something, right? Instead of just kind of in our thing, like, hey, man, uh, what have you played around with? We do this all the time in NYCRB. I, we literally make people get up and say, what are you proud of? What have you worked on? Talk to somebody you've never talked to before. You could be sitting next to a person who has opportunity for you. He's an API developer, and she's an awesome graphic designer. And if they link up together, wow, I can actually see my code that I've been working on for so long, and I don't know CSS for. It, it, it's a, that's where the ecosystem comes from. So then you actually can do some unboxing. I call, I, this word's sort of been resonating with me, especially the past week of my life. Um, unboxing. Um, I've been unboxing emotions. Possibly, um, that's an unboxing. Um, unboxing, um, can someone give me another, if you hear the word unboxing and you had to put your own definition onto it um, so it resonates to you. Mine was unboxing emotions, um, sometimes unboxing economics. I have people in my meetup that say, I 
don't know how to market myself and make money off of my skills. You know, I'm, I, I feel like there's people who are overseas that are, that are undercutting me and I can't, and I'm like, that's fear. Fear stand, is an acronym. It stands for false entities appearing real. Those are the things you want to unbox. You want to get it out of your life because those are energies that can hold you back. So can one person tell me what the phrase unboxing means to them? There's someone in here that it's resonating with right now to unbox something from you. Anyone? Can you raise your hand? Someone help me out. Yes. That's a fair assessment right there. You're trying to peek inside something that's a black box. It was opaque to you before. Um, you don't know how to open it up. You might have to bang on it a little bit, like you know, Space Odyssey with the obelisk. But the goal is, is that you you don't know what's inside of it. But once you do, you're not afraid to address it. I think that's the most important thing, is that we have a lot of baggages that we have that we need to address and get out. Um, when I teach at NYU, actually, my number one student was a woman who retired. She was 66 years old. She just she played French horn professionally, and she just wanted to learn a new development language. And I taught her. And she wound up being, ah, my gosh, she's one of the greatest programmers I've ever seen. I tried to hire her multiple times, and she said, I'm just here for the fun. I just wanted to learn a new language because, to me, music and programming went together and all of that. And I was like, oh, like you're the unicorn. Come on, let's get this money or something. <laughs> and she said, no, I, I really do it because I'm passionate about it. And no names, but the worst student that I've ever had was a, uh, a guy who knew who was a developer, I won't name any names, I almost did, for 15 years, and he had 15 years worth of baggage in his head that he would not let go. It was just holding him back, too. And he actually quit the class after the first exam, because he said, this Ruby, it's just too wild for me, man. It's not even a safe language. I heard it doesn't even scale. <laughs> so... Then once I came back, I realized I still had a little bit of ability. I can put both feet into, if this is a line right here, you know, I can dance over here in Ruby and possibly contribute a little bit over in other technologies and such. Um, I came up with a package one day called uh, Bubble Tape. I remember I used to eat this stuff when I was a little kid. My mom hated me for that. My dentist loved me, though. Uh, <laughs> and um, what Bubble Tape is, is I started um, venturing off into the Java the Java ecosystem, and with the Java ecosystem, they have little, small, tiny, succinct tools, and I started removing my asset pipeline from my system. I started getting billing more APIs, and then I started saying, well, how do I get these templating systems? And I, st and I asked the whole Ruby community um, at NYCRB and even on Gitter and such, um, and I said, well, how... What, what can I use for asset pipelining for APIs? And everything I just kept seeing was more integration. We're going to do, we'll take care of their, their job and their job and their job. And I just said one day, you know what? I'm never doing assets in Ruby again. I'm going to let something that actually has proven to do assets better in a JavaScript ecosystem. That doesn't mean I'm leaving Ruby. It just means I'm building more kick-ass APIs. And I'm not worrying about things like, well, how do I get this view into my endpoint? Really, we're doing content negotiation and HTML parsing all in a, uh, that's a little rough there. So what I'll do here is, uh, let's get out of here, and I'll show you a couple of things before we take off. Now, bubble tape is this. Uh, you can check it out, too. So what bubble tape does, let's, I'm really good with this marketing talk here. Uh, it says, let's see here, six feet that it does. It has uh, ES6 transpilation. Uh, multi-entry bundling. So just think when you have these JavaScript libraries that you want to bundle up, and it might be this thing has four dependencies, then you just throw it all through bubble tape, which really is just roll them or roll up with a great configuration. And then you have your bundles distributed. That's for my home page, even though it has five different dependencies. It just takes all of your modules and does it in microseconds. You know, the asset pipeline probably still takes a second to load up. Um, also, Dead code elimination. Who's heard of dead code elimination? I never heard about that until I went over to the ES6 land. I was like, what is this dead code elimination? They're like, well, if you have module A and B, and module B has two methods in it, but module A only requires one method in module B, 
it's going to just delete that second method in module B while it's, you know, bundling everything up. And I was like, what? Ruby's got to have this. Does Ruby have this yet? Yeah, that was his answer right there. Um, either way, you know where it's coming from, right? Because oftentimes we want to say, like, we were the ones who thought of this thing first, but we possibly didn't, right? You know, where does NBC come from? Did it come from Rails? Where did MVC come from? Java, absolutely. Uh, also, what we do is uh, we process and bundle SAS and let you choose between browser-based testing. TAP, I love it as a format. Guess what? Ruby does TAP as well. Uh, so now, also I found this, the all contributors here. Um, I, I got about five more minutes, right? Okay. Um, all contributors. If you all don't know about all contributors, um, now that your minds are um, what I call hashtag woke, <laughs> all contributors is a fascinating repo that has nothing to do with code. This is a specification for, a re for recognizing contributors to an open source project in a way that rewards each and every contribution, not just code. Ruby developers say, where the heck did these node guys come from all of a sudden? How did they ramp up so fast? You don't have to wait around and talk to you to talk to him to talk to her to get back to him to get my pull request in. If I give a valid comment, hey, I, can you tell me about this? Can you show me how to do that? You get a couple of those, now you're a contributor. What's the worst that someone can do? Submit a pull request? So I admire, I, if there's any free jewelry to take away, for sure, the all contributors, you're going to want to look at that. Um, and of course, bubble tape. HTTP spec, that's a little tool that Tom and I ventured off into, or Tom for sure. Um, he said, hey, how come there's no way to test APIs like straight from the HTTP level? Why is there no ways to test APIs? And then he went, ventured off into Go, and I saw him cutting his teeth doing the whole, you know, I'm in a dangerous territory, and like, why, why is this thing so cool? And he told me it was cooler over there. And then he wound up building a framework that is to test your APIs. If you want to test your API endpoints in microseconds, use this tool. It's really that simple. And this was just a proof of concept, and it's called HTTP spec, T. Mornini, HTTP spec. Like I said, if you have an API, use that. So we use that to test APIs. I use bubble tape to, you know, that's still node things, to do some front-end related stuff. And I'm now, it's like I'm actually getting more into the pure side of Ruby like I, like I used to. That's what I actually fell in love with. Um, I'm, and I'm encouraging this to all of the people who are in uh, NYCRB as well. So there's one last thing that I'd like to show you here. Where can you all contribute to all of this? There is... The, let's see here. Um, oh. Part in here. What do we got here? Is this the one? So first, pull requests. Um, this, is a val this is a pull request that I worked on with a couple people, and, and uh, I think people don't do enough due diligence inside of their pull requests. Um, if you see here, we have questions. Um, it's very open. I wasn't even a contributor to this uh, repo, but they were just right there answering everything. And they're like, dude, okay, that's a great idea. You got it. You get a little nudge or a badge right there. That's really cool. And I was feeling welcomed immediately. And I can be honest, it took me a little longer to do that in this community. So that's not a problem. Hopefully I could bring that back to this community, the things, because if we go, we, we might not, you know, oftentimes we say, well, if I go over to that land, I might never come back. <laughs> And I promise you, you'll come back, and you'll come back bringing some good tidings, too, as well. So this is last and definitely not least. I think this is it right here. Yes. Here we go. This I couldn't wait to show you all. I'll leave you with this. Uh, so I went to Ruby, and I said, OK, well, Ruby, let me compare these two. OK, 44,000 commits, 44,673 commits. That's pretty cool, all right? So we go to the graph so we can actually see some traction because what I wanted to know is what's the contribution of the ecosystems? How did no just hockey stick like that when Ruby's been around twice as long? No, much, much longer, actually. And so I was like, oh, wow, like there's, um, there's tons of people here. This is so cool. This is so cool. I wish I knew how many people were in this. And the Ruby side of me from the old school way would say, oh, well, let me go install this gym. I'm going to create this gym and wrap up all of these things. And 
wait a minute, you're in, the, you're in the console, dude, what are you doing? Query selector, I use dollar sign. What is going on with, what? Okay, and so I was like, wait, there's a pattern here. There's definitely line items. Let me find out some class on this thing and let me go into the browser. And uh, yep, yep, there, I found it. And up some weird, mar oh, divs, oh, oh boy. Um, yeah. So repo seems a common pattern. So I'm going to do query selector all repo. By the way, that's all you need for jQuery now. That is jQuery pretty much. So there's a thousand. There's a thousand contributors to Ruby. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I know what I'm about to do next. I am going to see how many are in Node. You already know what you all do when no one's looking. 18, what was that number? 18,000, what was it? Did anyone see? Okay, it's like 18,000. Here's the piece de resistance that should, that is, I'm telling you, is gonna light fire up under your butts. What are the chances of that? Let me pause that. What are the chances of that? What are the chances of that? There are 1,000 contributors to Ruby, which started eons ago. There are 1,001 people contributing to Node. So one person in here could actually topple that off. Not to say it's a topple, but why are we so competitive? Why do we have to be competitive? Why can't we be complementary? Um, because that's something to not shake a stick at. If you've been around for 10, 20 some odd years and someone comes around and within a couple of years, now they just are one up on, they just one up this. So approach it from a non-competitive form but a very complimentary one because look at, look at how fast I got answers. I didn't install Ruby, I didn't install gems or anything, I just went right in the platform. And we can go back to my slides here. Uh, I'd like one more. Great, so now since we are all wide open and you know how to go to all contributors, definitely please read it. And as you read it, try to pass it on to as many people as you possibly can. Um, famine, that's another word. If you see, I've been trying to have trigger words here a little bit, but not trolling words. Um, one of the things that got me off my butt to do a bunch of work is I realize that it should be about you. If you're using my tool, if you're using my tool, and I'm not getting the idea out to you, because developers oftentimes are very precious, you know, oh, it's just one more little tweak of that thing right there, one more optimization. You have to approach it like the feature you're working on that if the person doesn't have it, they're going through famine, and one extra day, they're not going to eat. Make that person feel important and watch how fast they give back to you. And don't forget to pay homage as well. That's where cyclical mentorship comes. If you learn something, pass it on to him. And the minute you learn something, pass it on to him and pass that on to her. And you don't have to be smarter than anyone. It's piecemeal. You don't have, it's not a total, a, a total thing. If you learn one new cool thing, pass it on to someone else if you expect someone to teach you. Does that make sense? Capiche, everyone? And speaking of homage, uh, this is my buddy here. I told him that uh, he's in NASA, and I told him that um, he was like, well, I helped you get your jacket. We got the same jacket, dude. Shout me out. It's Veterans Day, and he is a veteran, and I just wanted to say happy Veterans Day to you all. Um, if there is anyone that would like to have me pair with you and sort of expose and hold your hand onto this sort of new culture that's emerging here. Uh, I am always willing to work with you. I, do, I work successfully with 5,000 people at NYCRB, um, and all of them are extremely happy, and they're damn sure full of pizza. Uh, my, <laughs> our sponsors have told us that. But happy Veterans Day, and thank you for your time, and um, thanks for letting me do a handstand for you. How cool was that handstand? <laughs> thank you, thank you.